Thank you, Kenny. It is such an honor to be here and a privilege to speak uh, on stage with Latifa and Wanjira and Terry and Drew and Akila. I feel like I'm the luckiest white boy in the world this morning. <laughs> It is my belief that we are part of a movement that is greater and deeper and broader than we ourselves know or can know. Uh, in this country, it has many roots. And for me, it actually goes back to Emerson and his 1836 essay on nature, which is a really seminal event. And what is lost now, it's worth reading today as it was then. It was, he self-published it. It was 500 copies. He took six years to sell the first 500. Two years later, he gave a speech at Harvard, which is enormously controversial based on his first book. And uh, there's a quote here, who looks upon a river in a meditative state and is not reminded of the flux in all things? The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or a particle of God. And, and when he said that, what he was saying is that the individual is better and better touch with the spirit of God through the mediation of nature than he or she is through the church. And believe me, it caused a scandal. <laughs> nature, as he said, never became a toy to a wise spirit, right? But in 1847, a Vermonter, George Park, Perkins Marsh, who is often given the credit of being sort of the progenitor of the environmental movement in this country, uh, gave a very important lecture on deforestation and became the basis of his book, Man and Nature, which was the first book to talk about this relationship and dynamic between society uh, and the environment and how they interact and relate to each other. There was something prescient about it, but there's something missing about it because there was still a kind of a man over, and I use the word very gender specifically here in his book, of man over nature. Very different than Emerson, which is human beings within nature. But both of them were preceded uh, by an African American, uh, John James Audubon. He came from Haiti. He came here to dodge the Napoleonic draft. And he became basically the National Geographic channel of his day. When his book on the avifauna of North America was published, it was sensational uh, on the East Coast. People had never seen uh, what it was he painted. He was courageous, he was fearless, he went with one other person into areas all across this country uh, and did his work. But then in 1851, Thoreau delivered his famous lecture at the Concord Lyceum in which he said, in wilderness is the preservation of the world. And at that same time, here in California, a kind of uh, an, uh, a carnival barker type of guy named George Gale had heard stories from miners and did something that rocked the East Coast and helped the environmental movement tremendously. He heard that in the Calaveras Grove in Yosemite, there was this tree that was so magnificent, it was called the mother of the forest. And he decided, and for why we don't know, to cut it down to cut it down, to take sections, and to take the bark ring, which was 92 feet in diameter. This tree was 300 feet high. And to take it on a train to the East Coast as part of his show to you know, charge admission for. So he and many, many men went there and began to cut the tree down. They used cross-cut saws. They used everything they could. They sawed right through the tree. The tree was so heavy, so symmetrical, so perfect. It stood right there. It didn't move. They cut another tree down and used a battering ram to knock the tree down. The tree stood there. The mother of the forest wouldn't move. They used... They used wedges and pounded wedges into it. The tree would not move. And 25 days later, a real gale blew. A wind came up, and that tree blew down in the middle of the night, and miners 15 miles away in camps were awoken by the noise of the mother of the forest falling. Horace Greeley wrote then in the New York Herald Tribune that this was villainous, villainous speculation and vandalism. In Boston, a magazine writer wrote, to our mind, this was a perfect desecration. What in the world could have possessed a mortal to embark on such a speculation 
with this mountain of wood. And next to the mother of the forest was a tree that had died before they got there, naturally. It was called the father of the forest. This tree was 450 feet tall. Right? This is in what is now Yosemite. And nine years later, Thoreau gives what is his most important lecture, I think, uh, to the Middlesex Agricultural Society, where he describes forest succession. Seems obvious to us, right? It was not obvious. It was a landmark lecture, and it defied the tenets of science at that time. And he was attacked by the same Horace Greeley, who wrote about the villainous speculation of the mother of the forest, as well as Louis Agassiz, the zoologist from Harvard University, because they believed in spontaneous creation. They were creationists. And here what you had is the roots of a split that's here with us today, which is theology trumping science. And in the EPA today are people managing our environment who believe the Earth is no less or no more than 10,000 years old and that evolution is a liberal idea. Right? So you can see, when we go back into our history and to the roots of, of where this movement started, there is some, some splits and schisms that are with us now. After this came Carlton Watkins, a San Francisco photographer who made this camera with 18 by 22 inch glass plates and went off into the wilderness, right, and took these beautiful stereo opticon photographs of Yosemite, which were sold to the East Coast. And then Albert Bierstadt from the Hudson Valley School. And you've seen his paintings in the National Gallery. Amazing, amazing vistas, you know of the west, of the Rockies, of Yosemite. You know, again, the Discovery Channel National Geographic of that time had a big influence on legislation. In 1864, Yosemite was given to the state of California. They become a park. And then in this century, the history is so elaborate and interesting, I can't go into it. But in this century, William O. Douglas, Wallace Stegner, Rachel Carson, Ed Abbey, Garrett Hardin, Gaylord Nelson, Dana Meadows, Jacques Cousteau, Eugene Odoms, Paul Ehrlich, you know, Rene Dubois, uh, E.F. Schumacher, Jim Lovelock, and the Gaia Hypothesis, and of course, our favorite and beloved David Brower. Now, what's wrong with this list besides its incompleteness, right? Well, these are such extraordinary, honorable, and honored people, but notice not one of them is a Native American. So the indigenous cultures did not have to integrate science, the environment, and spirit. <laughs> as did Emerson, Thoreau, and Marsh, and all who followed them, because they were never disintegrated, right? That lack of separation in their thinking, in their language, is almost impossible for us who are non-indigenously educated to grasp or to fully understand. Right? And parallel to this movement, at the same time, names just as interesting and stories just as fascinating as the environmental movement is this amazing social justice movement that arose in the world. And at the same time, I only know pretty much the American European history, but these histories arose in Africa, in India, in China, in Japan. There is an environmental history in all of these countries. We did not start it. Right? Both movements have come to understand that there is no justice without caring for the earth. And there's no way to save this earth, of course, without caring for its people. Both have come to appreciate the wisdom of first peoples for whom social justice, humility, and deep care and awareness of one's habitat are the same thing. For many years, I have traveled this country. I have given talks. Right? And as my grandfather said, you never learn anything when your mouth is open. But the fact is, <laughs> you are in the presence of people, and every audience and group and situation is completely different than the other. And I have come to believe, as Kenny said, that there is another superpower here on Earth that is an unnamed movement. It is far different and bigger and more unique than anything we have ever seen. It flies under the radar of the media by and large. It is nonviolent. It is grassroots. It has no cluster bombs, no armies, and no helicopters. It has no central ideology. A male vertebrate is not in charge. <laughs> this unnamed movement, you can clap for that. The unnamed movement. <laughs> It 
is the most diverse movement the world has ever seen. The very word movement, I think, is too small to describe it. No one started its worldview. No one is in charge of it. There is no orthodoxy. It is global, classless, unquenchable, and tireless. The shared understanding is arising spontaneously from different economic sectors, cultures, regions, and cohorts. It is growing and spreading worldwide, with no exception. It has many roots, but primarily the origins are indigenous culture, the environment, and social justice movements. Those three sectors and their subsectors are intertwining, morphing, enlarging. This is no longer or simply about resources or infractions or injustice. This is fundamentally a civil rights movement, a human rights movement. This is a democracy movement. It is the coming world. This movement is humanity's immune response to resist and heal political disease, economic infection, and ecological corruption caused by ideologies. These are citizen-based organizations. They are village self-help groups. They are non-governmental organizations. They are volunteer associations that address social and economic justice. Now, what I'd like to show are some slides, right, just a few to give you some sense. And this is the face, to me, of the coming world. And this is not. OK, this is the board of directors. <laughs> this is the board of directors of Exxon. And, uh, this is the other board of directors of Exxon. Uh, uh, this is Monsanto. This is what we hold sacred. Uh, this is Walt Disney. These people do not want any more corporate fantasies. Right? This is Coca-Cola. This is the real thing. <laughs> Cleaning up after Exxon. This is the former board of Enron. These, the people destroyed the lives of thousands and thousands of their employees and others. These are the people in India from whom they tried to steal $2 billion right? uh, with the Dabal power plant. This is Northrop Grumman. These are their sons giving them war profiteering and corporate welfare checks. Right? Right? This is what the corporations use to enforce corporatization of the world. This is the face of proto-fascism. This is the real media. Um, This is the man whose party is destroying democratic voter registration forms. This is the face of honesty, Meta Pakar. This is the minister of war. This is what a true leader looks like. And here are the two faces of this world, the black people, right? And I'm not talking about African Americans, I'm talking about our security people dressed in black everywhere in the world now, dressed in the same equipment made by the same companies and the same techniques. And look at the faces of the people on the left. Look at that child, right? Looking at that. What does she think, right? And this is Japan, thank you. And this is our Julia in Ecuador with the Uwa, right? <laughs> trying to speak truth to power. And again, in Narmada, right? Has anybody ever locked down? Do you know how vulnerable you feel when you're locked down? I mean, you can't even pee, for example. But I mean, you feel so vulnerable. This is an act of enormous courage, you know? And these are the people who have been redlined since World War II, if not earlier, right? Beginning to do what shouldn't have happened to clean up the messes that's been caused by our financial institutions and the women who are stopping corporations from building golf courses on the cemeteries and the graveyards of their ancestors. So this is what this world looks like. It is diverse. It is extraordinary. We have no idea how many 
of us out there. These are the Simonas who were kidnapped in Baghdad, who had the, in, right? But they had an NGO, Bridges to Baghdad, that's been working there for nine years, bringing food and medicine to the women and children who were hurt by our sanctions. This is the UWA presenting, you know, a pass due invoice to Occidental Petroleum. And here's Randy, you know, presenting his <laughs> pass due invoice. In Spain, right? In London, you know, here we are in Philadelphia, here we are in Colombia, here we are in Rome, here we are in Prague, here we are in Washington, D.C., and here we are in Ethiopia, and here we are planting trees, and here's the Ija in Nigeria protesting against Chevron, right? And doing what needs to be done, you know? And here we are protesting our imperialism in terms of food, and here is rainforest action, right again. And here we are saying no to the incarceration of our youth in this state in any place else, right? And yes to alternative power, right? And no to war in Turkey, and no to the Republicans in New York City. And this is a difficult and dangerous thing. This is our sister who we have lost. This is Rachel Corey crushed under an Israeli bulldozer. And this is Judy who we have lost, right? And Caesar, right? But it is a joyous, joyous movement with extraordinary people. Our Nobel Prize winner, right? And Don Chupe from Nicaragua, you know, head of a Contencino movement, you know, look at this. This is so beautiful, right? And here's Jose Bove, you know, farmers against junk food, right? The world is not for sale. And our beloved Dalai Lama, right? And here, right? So this is us. This is who we are, right? How big is this movement? What you're seeing here is the beginning of a list of the 130,000 minimum organizations in the world who work towards social and environmental justice. And that's the minimum. It may be 250,000 groups, it may be 500,000 groups. Read these names. They're unfamiliar to you, most of them, I'm sure, right? They are. We do not know how big this movement is. It's marked by kinship and community and symbiosis. It is Pachamama, it's mama, right? It's the earth talking back, waking up, you know? What you see is your kin on that screen, you know? And to give you a sense of how big this movement is, if I had started this tape on Friday morning at 9 a.m. when this conference began, and if we sat here all day Friday, all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday, all day Sunday, all night tonight and all day Monday, we still would not have seen the names of all the groups in the world who we are. It's so new, we can't recognize it. We're familiar with armies and governments and war and churches and religions, but this is, there's no precedent for what we're doing. What you are creating is completely unknown. It is everywhere. There is no center. There's no one spokesperson. It's in every country and city on earth. It is within every tribe, every race, every culture, and every ethnic group in the world. This is the first time on earth that a powerful non-ideological movement has arisen. And during the span of the 20th century, big ideologies were worshiped like religion. They dominated our beliefs. This is to speed it up so you don't have to stay here until Monday night. <laughs> but ideologies dominated capitalism, socialism, communism, right? In the words of Ed Hunt, Ideologies stalked the earth clad in armor. Right? They fought for the control of our minds and the lands, and it wasn't pretty. And we were told that salvation would be found in the domination of a single system. This is where salvation will be found. We know that as biologists, we know that as community organizers, we know that as ecologists. It's found in diversity, not in domination. This movement does not seek power. It's misunderstood that way. It seeks to dismantle power. 
very, very different. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's politically inactive. It means this, though, that its overriding agenda is to create a world where the kind of political power we're seeing is criminal, illegal, and unnecessary. It is only visible in its parts occasionally. And when they are seen, they are labeled by the media as environmentalists, anti-corporate, ragtag, marginal, poorly funded, true enough, ex-hippies, <laughs> liberals. And it's all true, actually. <laughs> But what's missing from these labels, and which cannot be tagged so easily, is the underlying vision and values and heart. And that is what makes this movement of movement. Because if you ask every one of these groups in the world to write down what informs them, what is it that creates you know, the passion to do the work that they're doing, and six, seven, eight, or nine things, and write it down on a piece of paper. And if you had a room or hall big enough, and you put it on the wall, and you walk down and you read every one of them, they do not contradict themselves. This is coming up. This is grassroots. This is the real deal. This has never happened in the history on Earth, ever. It's singular, right? As David Orr has said, it will prevail because we have better technologies. We have Amory Lovins and Paul Stamets and Jay Harmon and Janine Benyus and wind and fuel cells and permaculture and ecological medicine and much more. This stuff works. Their stuff doesn't work. Corporations are trying to co-opt this movement. They're giving money to charismatic environmental groups to co-mingle their names. You know, microenterprise and business are important, but business cannot define, own, or fund this movement. It is the working poor, the hungry, the children, the women of the majority world, the communities of color, the campesinos, the students, the monks, the nuns, the farmers, the landless, and the refugees that will define this movement. Right. <laughs> Last year, Randy Hayes and I had the opportunity to sit in town hall and be on stage in a dialogue with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama about the environment. And when it came to my turn to speak, I mentioned the now leaked, but at that time unleaked report by the Pentagon about global climate change and mentioned that isn't it interesting that while our president disavows the science around climate change, the Pentagon is and has been actively working to create uh, mechanisms and scenarios because it actually believes that climate change is going to happen. And in their mind, when the Atlantic gyre stops and all of Europe goes into an ice age and there's food shortages around the world, that every nation will become a fortress and that all alliances, all, everything will break down the world. And what I said to His Holiness and to the audience there is that why were we in town hall that day? We were there because of the Dalai Lama, but because of the Tibetan people, right? Climate change will make all of us homeless in the next 20, 30, or 40 years. We may stay right where we are, but no mountain, no river, no plain, no forest will be the same as it is today because of global climate change. The Tibetans were cruelly and horribly deracinated and made homeless by the Chinese. But how did they respond? How did they respond? We were there because of how they responded, not with hate, not with vindiction, Right? right, not with vengeance. So it is up to us to decide how will we be, who will we be. This is what it is we're building, the capacity to respond. It is not going to be easy. Well, after I said that, the Dalai Lama turned to me and said, oh, very gloomy. <laughs> Which I thought it was not, but uh, I respect him so much. And he started to talk about emotions, and he started talking about the dark emotions, which is my cue. And following Paolo Lugari, I said, well, of course, the good news is that the most recyclable, you know, renewable resource we have in America are crises, you know. And he looked at me, and I said, and the good thing about the dark emotions is that emotions are completely recyclable, right? And he looked, and he said, he turned, and the audience is laughing. You didn't, I noticed, but he, the audience laughed. And, <laughs> 
And he turned to his translator and he said, no, no, Buddhism, Muslim is not recyclable, you know. And, and, the, and his translator was in Tibet, duh, 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 and he said, ho, oh, joke, ho. Oh. <laughs> and he said, ho, oh, 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 oh. But the fact is, if we just look at the data, the future does look bleak. There's no question about it. And if it doesn't look bleak, you're not looking at the data. But we have to ask ourselves, are we so fragile and powerless? This movement is our blessing. It is our refuge. It is the biggest tent humanity has ever created. Some of these groups have 20 million members. Some of them have four to six million members. This is the real deal out there. It knows and recognizes itself everywhere in the world. This movement grows because it knows who oppresses them. Farmers know who cheats them. Downwinders know who pollutes them. Fisher people know who depletes them. The localized poor know why their children are hungry. Every soldier knows at the end of their life that the government used them or we would have in government Dennis Kucinich, Department of Peace, and the Minister of Peace would be on television every day, not Donald Rumsfeld. Right? Mm. This movement sees that the United States does not fight for democracy, it fights to prevent it. It sees America's most expensive weapons being used on the world's poorest people. This unnamed movement that we are part of is profoundly democratic. Democracy does never, never happens in boardrooms. Democracy is juicy. It's sweaty. It's just like sex and good food, right? <laughs> it moves. We are moving towards a voluntary history. This is biology, theology. This is liberation, ecology, and above all, the cessation of injustice. The systems of power are getting a sex change operation. <laughs> <laughs> this dictatorships of ignorance are crumbling, right? This dishonor. This long, long, 500-year-old dishonor of people of color everywhere has to be addressed. We must reflect upon it, and it must be made whole, or there is no future. This movement is about... <laughs> it is about possibilities and solutions. Humankind knows what to do, just as Wanjira talked about today as LaDonna talked about, as Marta, humans know what to do. We need to listen and ask them. That takes humility. Humans, humus, humility, all have the same root in the English language. And just as nature can heal and restore, social restoration is a natural act. Just as Tom Lindsay said, you know, what we do is remove the obstacles to healing one by one by one. We are practicing empire disobedience. As T.S. Eliot put it in his last stanza of the Four Quartets, he said, we seek a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. This movement presents truths that are common sense, but they can be wildly unpopular today. It is not easy to oppose and to create at the same time, but it can be done. And on the screen, <laughs> up above their cheeks, it says, estamos ganando. The translation is on their cheeks, which it says, we are winning. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the movement that you are creating. We have brothers and sisters everywhere in the world, in every city, town, and country. We do not know when or if we will meet again. So what a gift this moment is. What a gift you are to the world, all of you. And I thank you from my heart for your sacrifices and for your courage and for your spirit and for your beauty. You, know, you are unbelievable. You are so magnificent. Thank you so much.